This conference uh, will now be recorded. I hope you find it useful. Um, I'm Douglas Hagley. I'm the Chief Digital Officer at the Minneapolis Institute of Art and I'm co-chair of the MCN Strategy SIG along with uh, Trisha Robson. And this session today follows on from a session we had last week on May 8th where we discuss strategies and frameworks for considering where digital and revenue might intersect you know, in the museum arena. Today's session is meant to dig into specific actions and initiatives a little bit deeper. As we've discussed, many of us are being asked some version of the question, how can we uh, use digital to, to make some money? So Trisha and I have planned these web sessions uh, for a deeper dive into the question and its related content. We are considering additional sessions, so if you have an idea, drop it in the Basecamp site for the SIG and stay tuned for that. Honey, why am I not driving? I'm going to drive. This is why I'm just listening. I have nothing to do with this. That's how online meetings go. Um, so we're going to look at various initiatives that museums and cultural organizations have tried or are contemplating. Um, how are museums thinking about revenue streams from things like, you know, online memberships or virtual events and tours or social media and YouTube, online courses and more. So we will cover some of that in the hour today. But before we get started, let's meet our panelists. Uh, Mandy, would you jump in and do a quick introduction of yourself, please? Yeah. So hi, everybody. I'm Mandy Kosick. I'm the digital media producer and project manager at the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, and there I help manage our in-house team where we produce a bunch of videos for our YouTube channel, uh, which I'll be talking more about later on today. Thanks, Mandy. How about Sean? Hi, I'm Sean O'Broy. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Um, my group sort of oversees the museum's digital strategy and we do everything from sort of core IT to multimedia production and online, uh, et cetera. Thank you, Sean. And last but not least, Alice. Hi, I'm Alice Walker. I am the Managing Director for Art Processors. We're a creative technology company based in Melbourne, Australia, and as a startup with budding offices across the US. And um, we do lots of different kinds of programs for museums and cultural attractions. Um, and I'll be talking about some of the things today. Thank you, Alice. So today's session is meant to be a kind of roundtable discussion. It's not a lecture, there isn't a slide deck. Um, we invite questions and comments in the chat. So we'll try to respond as best as we can as we move along. We may not get to everyone. Apologies ahead of time for that. We will try to save a little bit of time for dedicated Q&A in the second half of the hour uh, in case there's a really important burning question you want to get out there. So let's, um, let's kick it off. Sean, I'm going to sort of start with you. I, I think in our sector, a lot of museums have been trying to figure out some way that they can sort of monetize their digital assets. Can you give us uh, your perspective on that, please? <laughs> well, uh, Douglas, my perspective is we're screwed. <laughs> Um, I, I think it's it, it's a it it is a challenge, and I think this is a, one of the reasons why I was interested in having this discussion today. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my intro, one of the things that I've worked on here at the ROM is the digital strategy. And uh, when I was having conversations with last year with our board and trustees around the, the financial support that the museum would would need to make in order to really implement a digital strategy, the kind of changes that I was proposing or I am proposing. Um, one of the questions I kept hearing back from them was, what's the ROI? And it struck me that a lot of times when we've been talking about digital, we talk about sort of what the qualitative assessment is, like who are the audiences we're going to reach and things like that. I don't know that we've really spent so much time talking about how we could quantify that, like how we could say by this amount of investment in this sort of digital activity will lend itself to, you know, a certain percentage of increased revenue in these across these areas. And, you know, I, so I, when, when I was, you know, looking at this question, I spent some time reaching out to colleagues. I think, Douglas, I actually had asked you about this at the time. And, you know, I spoke with Nick and I spoke with Jane Alexander, like people who are really have been doing this work and know this stuff. 
And I think, you know, the best example that I had saw, I, I had seen of that type of rigorous analysis at looking at sort of the return on investment in digital uh, initiatives was um, some work that Jane and her team had done at Cleveland around art lens, um, which is fantastic. And I think, and I don't know if Jane's on the call. And so Jane, forgive me if I'm, you know, misstating the, the results of the study, but I think that they saw that there was a meaningful increase in terms of visitor attendance to art lens and that visitors were more likely to spend more times in the gallery and that there was a positive correlation by making these sorts of digital investments in the museum to you know uh, increased visitor engagement and attendance and the like um, but the 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 tricky part of that is is that that all presupposes that we can have visitors come into our museums which right now none of us can possibly do and I would even go further and say that a lot of the digital activities that we've spent our time as a community working on, um, these in-gallery digital experiences, websites, mobile apps, open access initiatives, social media, partnerships with Wikipedia, Google, you know, all of this stuff that we've been doing, all of this great work, um, is fundamentally around, you know, how do we promote our institutions, and, you know, as well as, you know, you know fulfill the, the mission of the museums, but also I think there's an implicit or maybe even an explicit assumption that all of this digital work will help drive physical attendance, right? And by, by uh, uh, and, and flowing from that will be increased revenues in terms of you know, uh, tickets, special exhibitions and the like. But again, if we can't actually have visitors come into the museum, I, you know, the, the, the real trick is how can we find other ways to monetize all of this activity that we've done that is not tied to things like physical attendance in the building? And I honestly don't know that we as a community, as a sector, have done that kind of rigorous quantitative analysis, looking at the question of this amount of investment in these sorts of digital areas will result in these other kinds of downstream revenue. Um, so I don't have a good answer to the question. Um, I think that uh, things that I have seen effective here at the ROM and, and, and elsewhere are things that are not so much revenue generating as budget uh, relief activities, in-kind partnerships and the like. Uh, we've done uh, had success working with uh, partners here in Toronto, for example, on a number of digital activities, again, mostly related to things like our special exhibitions. Uh, but those have been effective because we haven't had to you know expend the capital ourselves to do that um, but in terms of actually generating direct revenue from you know subscriptions fees the like you know the kinds of things that we would typically associate with museum activity like attendance exhibitions um, i haven't seen a lot of good examples i'd very much be interested um, in 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 hearing about work that other people have done in this area uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical that these activities can actually sustain themselves in a museum environment, if only because museums generally, with some exceptions, don't have the type of content creation, digital content creation capabilities to feed that sort of steady stream or things like, I don't know, Mandy's gonna talk about YouTube, but like that production capacity to do things like, you know, the Netflixes and the Amazons and the rest of it. And Sean, both of you and I worked at the Met in New York. Um, so one of the issues there, you know, for any museum is branding. The Met's got an awfully powerful brand. And I, I remember that we were all pretty convinced that we could license uh, our digital photography and make lots of money that way. Uh, yeah. Do you remember how that went? Yeah, I remember it very well. <laughs> when, we, when I started at the Met in, uh, in 2006, um, I think the image licensing uh, activity was something like $800,000 a year. That didn't even color the, cover the cost of the salaries, though, for, for the staff that were in that. But over the time that I was there, um, that, that market just absolutely cratered, right? And I think one of the reasons why, aside from, you know, again, fulfilling mission, promoting the museums and the collections, I think one of the reasons why we've seen, we've seen such an uptick in open access initiatives over the last couple of years is museums re realize that that traditional licensing model, at least for you know uh, photography of a collection, just doesn't really exist anymore. Okay. And I think you know, one other thing is like uh, I think talking talking about like partnerships. I mean, there are plenty of museums that still will want to do licensing of their digital assets. There are 
you know, groups out there like Bridgman and the like, I'm not endorsing any of them, but I mean, as an outsourcing model, I think that really makes more sense than trying to do all of that activity in-house if your institution is not ready for something like open access. Thank you, Sean. I'm going to um, move over to Mandy because Mandy, Corning Museum of Glass has done something kind of interesting with you two, and I wonder if you'd be willing to share with us how you decided to do that, what some of the results and challenges have been. Yeah, definitely. So I'm actually going to refer back to something that Nick said on Friday in the first part of this um, series was that you really can't ever just turn on a spigot and start generating a bunch of revenue for your museum. We all wish that could happen, but that's <laughs> very rarely. I don't know if that's ever happened. So with us, it started back, um, well, really like over 10 years ago, we've been producing regular content for our YouTube channel for over a decade, um, building up our live stream audience and our video programming, and then the in-house department that creates that content. So um, by the time that we decided to consider monetizing our YouTube channel, it was last fall, last September, is when we sat down and actually said, okay, what needs to happen in order to see if this could work? Um, so at that time, we put together a plan to slowly roll it out. We turned ads on about 35 videos, and then we kept really close track. And I'll share that what we looked at are, we wanted to see how our audience would respond to this kind of thing, because after spending a decade of building up resources, um, it, in the similar way of like open access images, you know, we had just been putting them out there on YouTube for people to watch. Um, but it was partially in conversations with Nick Uhouse, who is the uh, host of Blown Away, which the museum was involved with as well last fall. And he's just in talking with him, he was like, well, first off, you guys are crazy for not monetizing your YouTube channel if you meet the thresholds that you need to. And then he said that really, you know, like people look at it as your channel has reached a certain status. If you can run ads, that means that you have the number of followers, you have the number of watch hours per time that you need to maintain that uh, revenue generating status. And so he's like, people won't get annoyed by it. They'll just think like, oh, okay, they they finally made it and they can turn on the ads. And I think that's the way that YouTubers think about it, right? Is all of them are trying to gain their followers and get enough so they can turn on their ads. Um, but that's not our model, you know, we're just trying to get our content out there, but then also sustain our ability to continue creating these programs. So what we did is we looked at, with the test videos, the watch time that, um, or do people stop watching the videos when they hit the ad or not? Our subscriber count, are we losing subscribers or not gaining new subscribers because of the ads running? Uh, we have a really engaged community where people comment on the videos really frequently. So are we seeing any negative comments? And then of course the revenue itself, are we generating enough to want to continue doing this? And after a short test period, we discovered that people were continuing to watch, our subscriber count was growing. We got a few comments, um, but really not as many as I was expecting. Um, and then the revenue was making it worth it. So we then after, I think it was after a couple of months, then turned on advertising on almost all of our videos. So. Um, it's been, like I said, the, the point behind it mostly is to be able to continue producing the live streams, the lectures, and the things that we do. And um, so that's how, you know, if anybody asks, why are you doing this? And that's the other thing to consider, weigh the consequences. So now we had to say, okay, we're okay showing ads on our videos. Are we okay um, paying taxes on that revenue? Because that's something that you have to do when it's generated through advertising. Um, are we okay with, with all of that? And then um, making those, weighing those decisions versus just putting the content out there for free. I have a feeling your accountants weren't super happy to have to deal with UBIT unrelated yeah. business income tax. It's usually uh, uh, museum accountants get itchy when that when that comes up. We've had oh, a Mandy. lot of conversations. I've learned a lot about tax law. <laughs> it's been interesting. 
So, Mandy, I actually I have a question about uh, on that. Um, I, I wonder, have have you, uh, as within your museum, have any like further discussions about what other types of digital properties you might want to try to monetize in the same way? I mean, via advertising. I think uh, I think the advertising revenue model is is absolutely as you guys have proven. Um, one that can be effective for museums, but I'm I'm sort of curious about how far does one take it? Do we then start, you know, putting advertising uh, advertisements on our websites, for example? Um, I'm just curious in what kind of conversations you guys have had around that. Yeah, and that advertising on the website isn't something that we've discussed. Um, we have looked into, like, in the same sense of YouTube and using the video content if it would make sense to generate a Roku channel, because with that you can either run advertising on the channel or you can create a subscription model. So people would pay a certain amount, I think monthly or yearly to then have access to your whole library. Um, with that though, you have, to, you have to have the library of content to be able to share. Um, it needs to be a quality that's similar to the Netflix, the travel channel, the history channel that's that's on Roku. And you also need to host your own video on like AWS or Brightcove or something like that. Um, so not something we're going to roll out soon or maybe ever, but similar to like things that we're looking into. Um, but in the process of thinking about do we want to monetize our channel, I reached out to other glassmakers on YouTube that I knew were somehow um, getting money for what they do because they would go to different conferences and film and live stream from there. And mainly the number one thing that I heard from other people was sponsorships. So they would just get um, other companies or other people to sponsor episodes of their channel's show and then um, get revenue that way, which I think have any of you guys done sponsorships that you'd want to talk about that? Not in any way that I'm willing to brag about. So, but okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move over to Alice now. So, um, Alice, you've and I've known each other for a long time. You've often worked in adjacencies, right? You've been in private companies or publicly traded companies that do a lot of business with museums and provide a lot of content production, other things for museums. So can you give us a little bit on your perspectives on, you know, where, what, where, where does this work from, from your point of view? I think um, Chum and Douglas and I all worked at the Met many years ago. And later I worked for Antenna creating content for museums, including the Met. Um, and really what Chum was talking about, the, the challenge in being able to monetize the content that you're creating and putting out there is you really need to be operating in a huge amount of volume. So Mandy's institution is really being successful because you've been working for many years now. So this isn't something that you turned on overnight that even in September, you all were looking um, at how you were gonna be able to monetize your channel of YouTube. And I would say, especially when you're working with content like audio tours and other kinds of assets that is really rich content. Nonetheless, you have to be working in a huge volume to be able to make money um, and sell that. And there are a lot of IP issues. So um, it's really challenging to be able to make that fruitful in a platform like Audible or Spotify. You know, most of us are paying $10 a month um, for that kind of content for Spotify and Audible, and you're able to graze incredible content that's super highly produced. And so just like Mandy was saying too, most institutions don't have a big team who are dedicated to that. And if they do, it's been on a different platform. So um, my perspective in working at um, art processors is a lot of institutions um, before coronavirus were using uh, interpretive means to be able to either support their operations or to some degree are successful and are really doing revenue generating uh, programming such as on-site tours right and whether that's with your docents or whether that's uh, through membership with access to your curators or whether that's with audio tours and multimedia experiences etc um, many there was, I mean, I think everyone on this call is familiar with that feeling that the take-up rate was really low. And so there's been this real push against downloadable apps and a real question about sort of what's the next experience? Is it about devices? There are institutions like MoMA who have, you know, wands and 
apps and progressive web apps and you know the full suite of devices and they're really lucky to be sponsored by Bloomberg and they're really creating great content right um, but I think what we're really thinking about now all of us is what happens now how long is this shutdown gonna last and I think anything that's going to be successful right now in coronavirus is going to be successful not only now but when the doors open and so, right, everyone's been watching webinars, everyone's been looking to their neighbor to ask, what are you doing? How are you staying relevant? How are you staying operating? Um, the kinds of conversations that our processors is having right now are with institutions who want to use digital with us, and maybe it's not directly related to driving revenue, but is directly related to continuing to have an audience and serve that audience with the doors closed and as they ramp back up. So um, one of the things that our processor says, I'll give an example, um, is a queue management platform with the Museum of Old and New Art in Tasmania, um, which is where Art Processors was really founded. And so that queue management um, works with a location-aware app and ticketing. So people come in, they have a ticketed experience, they can line up in a digital queue that holds them, sort of sorts them in a period of time. Uh, and allows a small number of people to be standing in a physical line. Now that museums are really thinking about staged reopening, and of course it's different in different states, um, that's some of the interest that people uh, have right now and are coming to us to ask about, maybe they didn't have ticketed entry before, and now not only are gonna have ticketed entry, but timed entry. So what is that gonna look like? And is there an opportunity perhaps to have that kind of experience in a downloadable sense so that you're not worrying about sort of the, all of the um, issues of sanitation, let's say hygiene. Um, and, uh, you know, can you potentially have a heat map that shows where people are circulating so that you can have more control over your rooms? I think that's the first stage is for everyone just thinking about how are we gonna operate when the doors open again? Can we bring people in? Is it gonna be sustainable to have 25% of our audience? What does that look like and what's the experience like? Not only how do you deal with removing all the kiosks and removing all of the touch experiences and putting up, I don't know, arrows and you know having additional visitor services staff, right? All these considerations um, with all of the furloughs and you know just there's a lot of challenge that people are dealing with and I don't have all the answers by any means. Um, what I think is interesting though is digital I, I think there's this people are coming back to thinking about how digital is really a lifeline for institutions and so digital right now is attracting in many ways this big armchair audience right the audience who maybe will never come through your doors but who are being attracted to you know the cowboy who's taken over um, you know, social media or being attracted to, you know, the penguins running through the aquarium or, you know, are, are paying attention to people's YouTube channels again. So all of these, these new visitors, these armchair visitors, if are continued to be catered to, are going to be interested in your institution. And I think digital is the way of being able to do that, both to bridge bringing people back into the doors and then longer term, being able to continue to build out that digital audience yeah i think i think that um you know i think from a digital perspective i can say we have never been busier than we've been in like the last eight weeks i mean the whole the whole pivot to pivot to digital has resulted in us like churning out uh, a fairly significant amount of brand new digital content and i think unlike you know mandy and, and corning we we've had like you know, multimedia producers and and folks like that at the ROM, but it has not been part of our DNA for like ten years to do this type of content production, and so we've been doing quite a bit of it like fairly within the last few weeks, and we've absolutely seen in terms of visitor engagement online and through social and you know uh, and the rest of it that there is. Um, a, a meaningful and real armchair audience for this stuff right now. In some ways, it's 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 a captive audience, right? Um, people are looking to engage and get quality vetted uh, content from reliable, responsible places like museums. Especially, you know, our core one of our core audiences right now is uh, parents with kids at home, right? And so, in, uh, doing things like story times and the rest of live streaming and that kind of stuff to reach that audience. But when it comes to like then monetizing that, 
I think rather than, you know, we had talked about, is there like subscription models for this? Is there ways that we could try to incentivize folks to pay for the for offerings like that? And I think what we're trying to do right now with this is just to capture as much information, demographic information about this audience as we can so that we can solicit on them later for some reason, whether it's like pure philanthropy or that when the museum does reopen, we have a better, more granular understanding of who this audience is and what specifically they're looking for so that we can maybe better target them in the future. I mean, to put it another way, we don't quite yet know what we're going to do with this audience, but being able to capture as much information about this audience as we can right now, I think is really important. I hear you, and I think both of you are referencing a little bit of the short-term, long-term uh, nuance yeah. to this issue, right? So while, um, you know, I'm thinking on the short term, we've seen real success with, you know, we've had to cancel so many things. People had bought tickets months ahead of time for events or exhibitions, summer camps, classes, everything, corporate events that we were doing. We've had some real success with reaching back out to these people and saying, we're very sorry the event um, has been canceled two choices, total refund, convert your ticket into a donation. And we've seen, you know, a relatively high percentage of people willing to convert their expenditure into a donation, which has been really heartwarming and really wonderful. I don't think that's a sustainable model, but it might be a tactic that other museums could use in the immediate moment to just, just ask, sometimes just asking. But that longer term thought um, that I think all of you have referenced to some degree of saying, what are we learning now that will maintain a longer term potential revenue, whether it's the indirect, Sean, that you're collecting data has value, right? You're collecting data and you'll be able to use that data later for, for other kinds of asks or a sustained ad revenue model through YouTube. Are there other sort of thoughts that any of you have about a, a longer running sustained revenue model that is supported by digital? Looks like Mandy's well, inhaling to speak. Yeah. I'm like, I've got my mic off. Um, what, what I can share is that we've started talking with the advancement team and they're really interested in, since we already had been producing content that's shareable, is there anything that we haven't yet shared that isn't public that they can release as an exclusive for our members? So thinking about that longer term model, how can we entice members to see value in their membership even though they can't come visit the museum for free anymore, what value are they still getting? Why should they renew? Why should they continue to be members of the museum? And especially for our, you know, like high donor level circle, um, what content, digital content, can we give to them that is exclusive, that no one else gets to see yet, or that they get like a week or two ahead of the public? Um, so that's something that we've been looking into. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, I mean, we're 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 having the exact same conversations. Our initial uh, push was to be able to get some content out to as many visitors as possible. Um, but now that I feel like we're getting to, I don't want to say a critical mass, but we've got the the our content production to support this sort of virtual online audience. Now that we've got that sort of in flight. Um, we've been talking with our with our uh, membership people and our uh, fundraisers about that same tor sort of exclusivity. What is a what are the kinds of ex digital experiences that we could offer to our members, to our high value donors that are would that would be attractive to them in terms of feeling like they're getting you know. Uh, uh, get preferential treatment through their membership and through their donations. Although I will say one thing that's interesting, and again, I don't know if this is a, a long-term sustainable thing, we've actually surprisingly seen a very slight uptick in our membership. Um, people who are coming up for renewal who might previously not have renewed or that we weren't sure will have renewed, we're finding that they are renewing. And I think that's just a sort of natural philanthropy. Like people understand that museums like small businesses and lots of other organizations are going through like a financially tough time. And because there is that uh, predisposition to sort of trust and want to support museums, we're, we are seeing that right now. Whether or not that's going to last over the long term, I don't know. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why we're looking at the same types of things that Mandy's talking about, these, these sort of specials for our members and our donors to keep them engaged. I have a thought too, which is not exactly what you were talking about, Sean, at the end of your first um, 
where you were asking if, if we've had success with sponsorships, say, but I feel like there's, I've seen some more consolidation and more institutions sort of buddying up. And I think that kind of consolidation, um, it, we're going to see more of as um, the, the shutdowns kind of stretch on and the chance that institutions are going to open and have to reclose and reopen. Um, I think that in my my organization it's really interesting because you know more than half of my team is in australia and so the clients that we're working with primarily are in either australia or the united states and australia is opening up a lot quicker right they have less cases it's a far bigger um, geographic region with less cases and so um it, it remains to be seen what's going to happen in the us and in australia but i think some of the institutions there are really starting to cater to their local audience realizing that they'd had restrictions with states so you couldn't cross state lines or you'd have to be quarantined and so institutions who are starting to reopen are really catering to the international armchair audience through digital but starting to think about programs to bring people through the doors that are going to be local and so partnering up with some institutions to do outdoor experiences um, we're working on a project with one museum, the Western Australia Museum, where they're really featuring a lot of artists and bringing content in from local um, artists, uh, musicians, poets, things like that. And that was already, much like Corning, part of their initiative. That was pre-COVID. It's not driven by um, the crisis. But because of that, it really appeals to um, highlighting stories if you will i guess and and uh the more information about that region um and so they're budding up with other institutions to think about how they can tell those stories more so servicing the content on site for visitors uh, and they'll even have um in their retail stores you know books and other things that are being sold by the people who are producing that content so sort of featuring them as co-contributors so there is a bit of a virtuous cycle there um, and I, I think that that kind of both partnering with other institutions so you can attract visitors who are local and have sort of a day of it um, is going to be something that we may see more of here in the U.S. Too. It'll be interesting, uh, Alice, to see how that shakes out. I mean, I think in, in some ways the museum community is like amazingly, you know, collaborative. I know I remember, I don't know if Brian Thornburg's on the call, but I remember him saying to me that, you know, when he first joined the, the sort of museum community, he was really struck at like how open and generous people were with their time and their expertise and everything like that. But when it comes to like that kind of local collaboration, I think in some ways like museums in the same place are kind of in competition with one another, right? They're 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 competing for the physical visit and visitors can only spend so much time in certain places. So like what if I was in New York, like it would be I, I'd be hard pressed Douglas, to think of an example where the Met and the MoMA and the Guggenheim would, and the Brooklyn Museum would all get together and say, oh, we're all going to do this thing together. The Met's like, no, I want everyone to come to the Met. Um, so it, it'll be interesting, you know, uh, to see how this how this evolves, because I, I do think you're right. I mean, we are going to be in a new sort of reality where we are going to be very much reliant when museums do open back up on our on our local audiences, right, as opposed to uh, foreign tourists or people driving, you know, not having driving, but who have to fly in in order to arrive at our destination. I think so. We're going to have to try to um, uh, do what we can to sort of capture that market, and it may be that that kind of collaboration between museums helps all of us. But it it will be interesting to see. That's a good point, Sean, uh, and it's slightly off our topic today. But one of the things that we're doing here in the Twin Cities is uh, collaborating with all of the other cultural institutions to think about the messaging we have around reopening and sanitization and dates that we'd reopen and practices. So we feel if we have a more standard approach that the public will have more confidence in going to any single institution. So that's definitely uh, uh, an interesting, an interesting challenge we all have. Um, Mandy, there was a question in the chat from Christina Gibbs about rights issues. Have, did you have to mitigate anything? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, copyright issues pop up all the time on YouTube. They have a really great like auto filter system where anything you upload gets put through and if there's any songs that are licensed they get flagged um if the video is from any other clip it gets flagged stuff like that um what's nice is that youtube doesn't like count it against you or ban you from using their channel it just says hey you can't monetize this video 
So recently, um, being working from home, we have been looking at, you know, what kind of what new content do we have that we can put on since we can't be in the hot shop? And so we're looking at videos that we had previously only released on DVD or that are just in our archive at the library that we might be able to get digital copies of and then trying to upload some of those. And with those, um, you know, they're older videos. And so we run into just a lot of copyright issues where, yeah, we think we purchased the licenses for these. Who was the director of that video? You know, it was before my specific department was formed. Um, is it on paper in somebody's office that we have to go dig into? So it does get challenging. And yeah, and that's just some, that's part of it. You just have to look at what's getting flagged. Um, and then how much does that really set you back? So obviously generating your own content and using license, uh, purchasing licenses for music or using like a streaming service where you've purchased it is the best bet if you're producing new content. But then of course, if you're uploading things that were either produced before you got there or uh, from a long time ago, you're just gonna run into those issues and then it's just a case by case basis on how you solve it. I, I would also say to the, to that point, um, like we've been going back and looking at some of um, some uh, like lecture series or other or other things that we had previously filmed at the museum, um, which which had been like paid uh, lectures and the like, um, and looking to see what of those we could put online. And we've had to go back in almost all cases and get like signed releases from the original presenters in order to in order to be able to reuse that content because it was never intended to be broadcast on our YouTube channel is intended to be like, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a physical a lecture in the gallery that we just happened to record. I imagine yeah, some of the been talking about like, uh, the images that might be shown in a presentation at a lecture, YouTube only flags audio. So I'm sure there are issues there. We did a we did a book read along with our education department and we had to get permission from the publisher. So I mean, okay. it's still, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, nuance to it. I was going to say though about the book read along, that's a really good idea. Thinking about the long term strategy, because as much as you can engage the families and moms audience, they're going to be the local people that will come back. At least from our marketing research, it's our local families and the moms are the decision makers around here. So um, right. putting out free content for kids right now isn't going to hurt you. It's going to help you in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that it, it, so far it has been our most popular uh, series. We've done, I think, two or three of these. We're doing it once a week. Um, and in terms of like, well, we're doing a live stream and then it's available on our YouTube channel afterwards. And it has definitely been the most popular. And coming back to what I was saying earlier about like sort of understanding your audience, um, we've absolutely seen that the, you know, according to Google Analytics, our demographics have shifted so that we've got now more you know, 25 to 40 year old females who are like tuned in and we assume that those are people, you know, mothers. A lot of that audience is mothers with children. I assume a lot of people who are on this call, um, maybe I shouldn't assume that. It's possible that a lot of people on this call uh, tuned into a webinar yesterday that QZM put on that has some really interesting examples of ways that people were sort of monetizing digital. One that I felt envy over, although I'm not sure it applies in, in the art museum world, was the Elmwood Park Zoo in Pennsylvania that was able to sort of rent out uh, virtual experiences with their giraffe at $150 for 15 minutes. You could have a giraffe sort of join your Zoom birthday party or something like that. I thought that was kind of astonishing and that they had something like 150 different people buy that experience. I don't think art museums quite have a live giraffe that they could do that with, but I was also intrigued that they talked about a live sort of telethon style thing they did on Facebook. Um, that kind of thing, asking for support from a broader audience, engagement plus revenue, I think is another example just to throw out there on this call in case people hadn't heard that. Richard Urban then brought up, um, and some of you may remember this, when Shelley Bernstein was at the Brooklyn Museum, they introduced uh, something that they called the, uh, Oh, excuse me, um, first fans, and it was an online only digital membership model. I don't remember that being very successful. Are any of you considering something like an online only membership? And if so, looks like Alice remembers that better than I do. Go ahead, Alice. 
No, I, I think she did some incredible things at the Brooklyn Museum, but I don't remember that taking off. I remember that being an interesting um, proposal at the time, maybe too early for its time. We, we haven't talked about that, but I think if we were to talk about that, it would come back to what I was saying previously, that you would really need to have a critical mass of content that you feel you would be able to deliver to that to those members to make it make them feel that it was worth their while for that type of membership pass aside from like the normal like philanthropic you know generosity right and it may need something tangible with it my sense is that there's there's a lot of opportunity for this combined sort of physical opportunity that's catering to makers, catering to parents at home, catering to school districts, catering to, at some point we're gonna be saturated from watching Netflix. I hope it's not tomorrow. Yeah, that's um, a really good, yeah. oh, sorry, Alice. I was just, while you were saying that, I was. that's absolutely what I was thinking about. In some ways, I think we also need to remember that we are not the only people who are trying to reach, you know, the, the armchair audience right now. Like everybody has got their, their oar in the water. Um, and this is just one of like dozens and dozens of different types of, of places that are just like pumping all this stuff out to try to like capture eyeballs. But sorry, I interrupted your thought. No, no, not at all. I just think we we still do need entertainment, right? And so people are coming to our museums for entertainment. People are taking our experiences for entertainment, right? And so we really need entertainment right now, right? Like, and it's it's going to get grim um, in a year if we're still doing this. If we're not thinking about how we're creating these experiences that are connecting with people, right? And our our making our lives better every day, right? In the way that a museum visit just completely changes your perspective. And, and we have these incredible collections and people. And so I do think that it's not out of the question to think about having a digital membership program or having content that people would want to pay for that's exclusive. So either if that's catering to an already existing membership group or paid experiences that have some sort of combination of physical and digital, whether it's going to be outside, whether it's going to be smaller groups going in, whether it's timed, phased, multi-part, I do think digital is going to be, it's just, it's inescapable at this point now. Yeah, yeah I mean, especially as, yes. oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, okay. go ahead. I was just going to say, like, especially as we're all looking at what happens when we reopen, it's not going to be a conversation that goes away. So all these ideas that we're generating right now are excellent. And we got to figure out which ones are the easiest to implement and test them out, see what happens. If they fail, try again. I think that this could be a really great opportunity for growth in the digital in museums in general. Good point, Mandy. And I think that experimentation is really important. And I'll I'll throw in the next two. We've had some success, and uh, Alice, you're sort of referencing this at our higher end donor level. We've been hosting uh, these cocktails with curators virtually, where those high end donors get an opportunity. It's almost like a ticketed event. They have to sign up for it. They're able to come on for an hour or so and just spend time with a subject matter expert. You know, we have these amazing collections. We also have these amazing educators and curators who know a ton about the collection, who have fantastic stories, training them up and supporting them for these kind of virtual experiences. I think there's maybe traction there. Those might be able to be ticketed events once we get better practice at how they, how they work and how we can market them. Uh, thoughts on that? I mean, I think that's right. I think uh, as Mandy just said, uh, we're, we are and certainly in my organization, we're, in the point of like trying to experiment along a number of different lines and i think some of these things we're going to find are not going to work and some of them will but i think what's really important is to try as much of these different avenues as we can during this time when we're sort of constrained and all the other sorts of things that we can do i mean one of the reasons why we've been able i think to to sort of fairly quickly get up to speed in terms of our digital content creation is that We've got a bunch of staff who aren't normally doing the types of things that they would normally do, right? Our educators are not doing school group visits now, and our project managers and designers are not doing their exhibition planning now. I mean, that activity is still happening, but not in the same way as it was two months ago. And so while we do have this creative uh, you know, workforce that 
could potentially be involved in a lot of this sort of digital experimentation, I think it would be really important to try to leverage those folks within your organization to see what kinds of ideas can we come up with and, and what are the things that are going to be effective longer term, right? Not just for now, but, you know, moving forward. So related to that, but unrelated to generating revenue, I wanted to put a plug in for a program that we've started with work from home staff who can't do their normal daily work functions um, is we are having them caption our YouTube videos. So if you turn on community contributed captions, anyone with a Google account can go in and caption the videos and submit them for review. And it's just a great way to increase the accessibility of your content. Um, and it takes forever, so people people can have stuff to work on if they have extra time. That's awesome. Really, in some ways, this is like, you know, you go to conferences and you hear people, you hear institutions who are going through a building museum, um, you know, phase, and you think sort of enviously, must be so lovely. I've worked on those projects. On the other side is the vendor where you're planning with them for a year and a half the content that's going to come out. And you're in this really precious bubble and it's still very stressful and you have a deadline, but you're getting to, to, to be more inward looking in a positive way and everyone's working towards the same goal. Right now we've all been forced to do that, right? It's not our choice. We're all in this alternate reality thinking, how do we get to the end of this? How do we sustain ourselves? How do we continue proving that we're valuable with this completely new paradigm, right? And it seems like I love that that's what you're doing, Mandy, that your institution's doing that. We have a client right now and we're working with them on a, uh, starting the second year of a three-year project with them. And they're doing a lot of their sign language videos right now and a lot of their access content, right? They're thinking about all their highlights content and how can they have audio descriptive and uh, verbal descriptive versions of that, which is wonderful, right? Really thinking about how can we be more accessible for our audience. Um, I also just thought um, when you were describing both of you about your teams who could be featured online, um, I don't know how many of you watch Saturday Night Live and have been watching it since coronavirus. And, you know, Saturday Night Live kind of dips and wanes in terms of quality. Um, but recently I have found it so entertaining that they've been able to create these shows and sustain it with performers in all of their own homes. And what it strikes me is it's really important to actually just stay fun, right? It's not polished. They're not carrying off the skits the way they would in New York City, but they're doing it with so much delight. And they're clearly bringing in talented digital folks, designers, motion graphics people who probably would not have as much of a starring role regularly when it's just the live broadcast. But it's so entertaining to watch even the stuff that's not executed very well, right? Because they're doing it for the entertainment sake. There's so much joy that they're carrying out. And I think that that's what we really have to continue to harness for our teams. And so it's as much about being not afraid to fail as it is having your teams practice online, right? Like no one signed up for this. No one signed up to be online for, let's hope it's only three or six months, but right. So we also need to build the skills we need to, look for more of those digital skills and we need to sort of embrace the folks on our teams who have those skills to bring in an extra level of personality and brand to what we're doing. It's a great point, Alice. And I think um, I've told this story before, but I, I've often brought um, improv people in to work with my technology teams to help them, I think, with their interpersonal skills and communication skills. And, you know, it doesn't hurt that all those Saturday Night Live cast members generally come from improv where they're they can deal, when you throw a wrench in the works, they know exactly how to pivot and deal with that. But it's an interesting challenge for all of us right now. Can we bring some of the practices of improv, the sort of yes and, like sort of go with the flow and, and don't be an anti in moments of stress? And it can be an interesting challenge. I wanna remind everyone who's on the call that we're looking for your questions in the chat. We've got about nine or 10 minutes left today. So if there's something you wanted to toss out, an idea, a question, or one of our panelists said something that you want to follow up on, please jump into the chat. Uh, and I'm gonna ask, since I'm not seeing anything yet, I'm gonna throw another one out there. Um, this idea of special access, how would you approach that through what digital channels, how would you sort of titrate visit, visitors to that, whether that's a Cocktails with Curators or with your director or an Ask Me Anything event, is, is there any creative 
technologies that you would use to help monetize something like that? Do you mean the software itself? Software, the platform, the registration, whatever piece of it that you, either you have experience with or you have an interesting suggestion for. I mean, I would say whatever you're going to do should have a, a web interface because everyone's using their mobile right now. Everyone is is toggling between their desktop and their mobile. So what you're looking to implement should have that as an underlying aspect of it for today and when you reopen. I mean, I think I'm, uh, I don't I don't do the the social media uh, at the ROM, but I think that tying that into social media, like if you're talking about like live streaming, like Facebook and things like that, um, can be valuable for all sorts of ways, right? Um, in terms of audience tracking, in terms of um, uh, uh, Facebook Facebook philanthropy and the like, I think that's a, that's been a really Facebook and Instagram both have been have been really important platforms for us over. They have been traditionally, but more so over than the last two months. Um, and it's one of those things that uh, everybody, most people are already on. And so there's not the additional burden of, well, you've got to download this or you've got to do, you know, install that or whatever. And I was just going to say um, nothing that we're actually actively producing or anything, but we're really inspired by the masterclass um, company and what they're doing with their uh, virtual classes. And obviously the people that they're getting to run the master classes, it's amazing. Um, and I think that the membership price point is relatively uh, not too high. I forget how much it is, um, but I was actually expecting it to be more expensive. And so we're looking at that kind of model and I'm thinking about if there could be ways to translate that into using the knowledge of our experts to do something like a master class. Douglas, I just I was gonna, you know, just wanted to come back to something I think I, I mentioned at the top of the conversation. It's like, you know, we're doing all of this work, all of our institutions are doing this work, and I assume we're also sort of, you know, measuring it. We're tracking it. We're looking at our views and we're looking at, you know, Google Analytics and seeing who's coming in and 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 the like. Um, I would just throw that out, out, throw this out to the group um, and to the audience that uh, I am very much interested in, in, in doing a sort of quantitative assessment of this too, right? Right now we've been running hard just to sort of like keep up, but I think if this sort of extends into a longer period of time, which is certainly a possibility, I think it would be important and useful for community to understand like what really does it cost for us to do this and to come back to my original question like what really is the ROI right and it may not be direct in terms of like somebody paid us this money in order to access this thing but we should be able to measure the the both the financial uh, you know uh, obligations that the museum has in terms of creating all of this stuff but also the ways in which they are monetized either directly or indirectly and I think doing that sort of like rigorous sort of financial analysis will tell us things and I think better position us for uh, for doing more of this stuff into the future. I really agree with you, Tom. I think being able to collect data and move beyond just like data reporting to true deep data analysis is going to be the direction that so many institutions who are embracing digital now in ways that maybe they haven't before. That's critical to being able to say this is successful, right? I mean, everyone wants ROI and everyone's competing for that right now and we don't have visitors coming through doors. Those are great points. And I think, Sean, particularly I'm going to ask of you and maybe Mandy, you can do the same thing too. As you develop some of those ROI metrics, posting them up on the Strategy SIG Basecamp would be really helpful just to know what you're saying, even if our data doesn't match, the way that you're talking about how you analyze the data is really valuable to everyone in the community, I think. Mandy, there's another question for you. Did you see ad revenue coming from only certain high-performing videos or is it more like a rising tide? I would say both um, to that. There are a number of videos that YouTube's algorithm has just really picked up on and serves to people that right now are watching longer videos. So we have one that's three and a half hours and it's getting on average over an hour that people are watching it. So um, 
we think that it's like they have it on in the background when they're studying, maybe sleeping, we're not sure. <laughs> um, but the algorithm keeps showing that to people as their recommended next video. And so that one's getting a lot of plays. And But then the rest of them, it's like you'll look at the ad revenue per video and it's a couple cents on one, a couple dollars on another, but then the collective of all of the videos contribute. So yeah, both. There are also some questions in the chat about you know paid education programs, and I think that's an interesting one for us, right? We we were queued up to do summer camps or or classes that often required physical materials in order to do that work. I know here at Mia we've experimented a little bit with like a kids drop-in art studio hour where we really have worked very hard to try to do projects where almost everyone would have this stuff at home, right? They've got some kind of paper, they've got some kind of implement that makes marks on a paper, so let's try this thing. I don't believe we've tried to monetize that, but I think this idea of taking what we know we can do and do well and trying to adapt it to a virtual environment is intriguing, and those kinds of experiments are pretty important. Yeah, I think one thing, just thinking about summer camps, because we've had similar sort of conversations, like can some of that physical activity take place digitally now, virtually, and what is the price point for that? Because I think one of the big factors in this, when you talk about things like summer camps or, or anything, like we saw this with like for, with museums and the web and the conference, is the question of time, right? A kid can go to summer camp and be there eight hours during the day and run around and everything like that. That doesn't translate into eight hours in front of the screen, right? And so figuring out what that balance is between how much of the physical can be can be translated into the digital, aside from like the cost, you know, the money involved and things like that, but also the question of time, I think is also really important. I don't, I, I, it'll be interesting to hear how organizations fare, but um, like you, um, Douglas, I listened to the QZM webinar yesterday and someone was roughly saying, the same thing that when they'd asked um, with summer camps if people were willing to go digital and what they were willing to pay, uh, it sort of split between a quarter of the overall price and half of the overall price. I would think time is about the same thing too, it's sort of a quarter of the amount of time or at best half the amount of hours or minutes that you might spend in a physical thing you can do online. You just atrophy and so yeah. It needs to be it's more very true. Right? I think the other, yes, I totally agree. And the other piece in there is that you know it's really summer camps are really about daycare, so that people can continue to work, and that a virtual summer camp may not really truly be a hands-off experience for younger children at all. <laughs> Certainly needs to be facil facilitated by the parent if they're under a certain age. Speaking as a father of a seven-year-old, I can say that. Fairly confident. <laughs> and I bet your Lego skills have improved greatly over the past few weeks. Uh, I see that we're coming around to the end of the hour. This is a conversation I'm sure we could continue the rest of the day, except all of us have another meeting we have to be on in five minutes. So I want to thank uh, all of our panels and give you some virtual applause for coming on and sharing your experiences, insights, thoughts with us. This is terrific. Uh, Tricia and I will continue to think about other sessions that would be relevant around these topics. If any of you have suggestions, please post them on the Basecamp site. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye. Thanks, Douglas. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Bye, y'all.